Hello, and welcome to this complete guide to Raksha for beginners. This is going to be a pretty long video, so let's get right into it. The table of contents is on screen, and clickable timestamps are in the description down below. We're going to start things off by going over some general information about the boss, and then we'll go over some sample gear and invent setups, look at aura choices, familiar choices, archaeology relics, and then it's all about the boss fight. We're going to go through every single mechanic the boss has in slow-mo, and I will go through every single strategy that I think is going to be useful for you guys to know before taking on the boss. After that, we'll put it all together and go through a full kill. Let's start things off with some information about the boss. Raksha has 1 million life points in solo mode and 2 million life points in duo mode. Raksha's affinity or base hit chance is 65 to ranged and 55 to melee and magic, which means that it will be easier to hit Raksha with ranged than the other two styles. Raksha has no weakness and is both stun immune and poison immune. Outside of that, Raksha's maximum hit is 10,000 damage and above, and he also has some insta-kill mechanics. And his attack speed is slow, with 2.4 seconds between every single attack. Now, let's take a look at a sample gear and invent setup for Raksha. Raksha can be done with less than this, but this is a good starting point for effective kills. It is also worth noting that I was able to no-food Raksha with this setup. We're going to go through every single item, one at a time. In my pocket slot, I've got a Scrimshaw of Cruelty. After that, I've got dual augmented chaotic crossbows. In my quiver, I'm using ruby of criminal bolts, although you could also use onyx or hydrix depending on your personal preferences. Following that up, I'm using an asylum surgeon's ring, although a ring of death would also be a good choice, and then I've got an amulet of souls, as well as a ranged kiln cape. For this video, I will not be using any armor, so my main 5 equipment slots are going to be empty, but the general rule is you want the highest tier power gear you can get your hands on, and that'll be more than good enough. Now let's take a look at the invent. I'm starting this off with an Elder Overload, although if you have a Supreme or a regular Overload, any type of Overload will suffice. After that, I've got an Enhanced Replenishment Potion. Following that up, I've got four Spiritual Prayer Potions, as well as an Augmented Royal Crossbow. It's augmented with Precise 6 and Equilibrium 4, which is an extremely cheap perk setup. I've also got Onyx Per Criminal Bolts in my invent, and that is because I'd recommend using either Ruby or Onyx, and you could also use both. Onyx Bolts give you some increased damage, and they also give you some increased healing as well, so if food is a concern, Onyx Bolts may not be a bad call. Aside from that, I have 6 Sardom and Brew Flasks, as well as 5 Blue Blubber Jellyfish. Blubber Jellyfish are really good because instead of being consumed in one bite, they're consumed in three bites, and they do not drain adrenaline when eating. The combination of Blubber Jellyfish and Sardom and Brews should allow me to heal up very effectively without costing my damage output too much. The remaining items in the invent are as follows. We've got Vulnerability Bombs, which should be applied every 60 seconds of the boss fight so that you can deal 10% increased damage. I've also got myself a Ring of Vigor and a Planted Feet Switch, as well as an Excalibur with the mobile perk on it. You could also bring a Melee Main Hand if you wanted to for Bladed Dive, although in my opinion, that is not absolutely required for the basic setup. Outside of that, I've got runes for both Vengeance and Disruption Shield. If you don't want to bring these, you absolutely don't have to, and they are what I would consider the most optional items in this setup. Now let's talk auras and familiars. For auras, if you're using melee or magic, because of the lower affinity, you're going to want to use the Berserker and Maniacal auras. They give you the most hit chance, and they also give you the most damage as well, so you can't go wrong. If you're ranging, you can use either the Reckless aura or Majorette, and it really comes down to personal preference. My personal record is actually on Majorat, but the world record was done with Reckless, so it's completely up to you, and you can try out both. You'll take a little less damage on Majorat, but your kills might be quicker on Reckless. On the familiar side of things, I would recommend a Ripper Demon, even when you're first learning. A Yakker Mammoth will allow for eating through all the mechanics, but it will result in slower learning, more GP spent per kill on food, and difficulty dealing damage, which can make the boss fight more difficult in the long run. The only scenario where I'd recommend a Yak or a Mammoth would be if you're simply going for one kill and then you're not planning on going back to the boss ever again. Even for that though, a Ripper could be easier and I would absolutely start on that. Now let's touch on Archaeology Relics. This is the optimal relic setup for general PVMing. The first two relics of Berserker's Fury and Fury of the Small are by far the most important, and then your third spot is relatively interchangeable. You could use the Font of Life, the Death Ward, or even something like Persistent Rage if you don't feel like stalling adrenaline. In this video, I'll be using Berserker's Fury, Fury of the Small, and Death Ward, but the setup is completely up to you. Raksha has both a solo mode and a duo mode. There are no new mechanics introduced in duo mode, and learning how to solo Raksha via this guide will also allow you to base Raksha in a duo mode, which means that you'd be able to take another person, and the person you brought with you would not have to deal with the majority of the mechanics, and would be effectively a free DPS. In duo mode, Raksha has double the life points, and all of the HP thresholds are just doubled, so it scales completely linearly. 
The last thing I will mention about duo mode is the drop rates are exactly the same. So there's no disadvantage to duoing like there would be at a boss like a Raxor, where the drop rates are significantly decreased. Now that we've been over some of the basics and some gear and invent setups, it's time to actually look at the fight itself. And we're going to start off by taking a quick look at the fight and attack pattern. Raksha attacks with magic, ranged, and melee in melee distance. After every four auto attacks, Raksha will use a special attack. The special attacks always occur in the same order, and we're going to go over all of that in a little bit. Prayer flicking, which is swapping your prayers according to what's hitting you, is extremely useful here. A beginner's guide to prayer flicking at Raksha is linked in the description below, and if you aren't experienced with prayer flicking, I would recommend watching that short video before continuing this one. With all that said, I think we've gone over everything that we need to know before getting into the actual fight and the actual mechanics. So let's do it. Before we get into the ordered mechanics that you're going to experience in the fight phase by phase, let's talk about Shadow Energy, because it's present throughout the entire fight. Periodically throughout the fight, Raksha will spawn a Shadow Anima pools in the locations marked on screen. The pools each have 1000 life points. If ignored for too long, Raksha's Shadow Energy percent will increase, resulting in increased damage dealt from him at a rate of 1% damage per 1% energy. It's effectively in rage, and if you let it get too high, you're going to have a really bad time. Certain mechanics will also be more punishing at high shadow energy percentages. In an ideal world, you're keeping shadow energy all the way at a 0%, but so long as it's under 20%, you should be completely good to go. If you let it get above 50%, it is advised to teleport out and try again, because it is extremely easy to die at those high percentages. The shadow energy percentage is displayed on screen right under the boss's health bar. And a little later on, we're going to talk about exactly what you have to do with these shadow energy pools, the best ways to clear them, and exactly when you want to clear them as well. But for right now, let's get into the actual mechanics of the boss fight phase by phase. We're going to split the boss fight into four separate phases and two parts. Part one consists of the first three phases, which will take Raksha from 800k to 600k life points, from 600k to 400k life points, and then finishing off from 400,000 to 200,000 life points. When phase 3 ends, that will be the end of part 1, and the boss will uber heal to 400,000 life points, and then the final phase will take you from 400k all the way to 0. In part 1 of the boss fight, Raksha has 5 special attacks that he can do. They are the Tail Swipe, the Magic Bomb, the Magic Charge, the Mind Lock, and the Shadow Manifestation. All 5 mechanics are extremely avoidable, and they are not too punishing. Let's break down all 5 of the special attacks, one after the other, and go through exactly what to do when you encounter them. The first special attack we're going to be looking at is the Tail Swipe. Raksha will unleash a roar and swipe his tail in a circle around him. If his tail connects with you, you'll be stunned and hit for between 4,000 and 6,000 damage. This can be easily avoided by stepping two squares back when the animation starts, or by using Escape or Bladed Dive. If you run away too early, Raksha will charge in a straight line at your current location, and if this happens, it is dodged in the exact same manner. Simply move out of the way of Raksha's path, and you will not be hit. Raksha's roar will be slightly before the tail swipe animation actually starts, and because of this, playing with game sounds on can actually give you a bit of extra time to dodge this attack. I wouldn't normally recommend playing with game sounds, but in this one instance, it does make this mechanic a little bit easier, and it's worth trying out. One final tip for the tail swipe is that if you do get hit by it and you end up stunned, you will not be able to use any of your keybinds, including food keybinds, but if you manually click a Sardom and brew from your invent, it will actually heal you up and allow you to drink it. The same can be said about gear switching and putting on a shield. If you're stunned and you try and use a keybind, it won't work, but if you click it out of your invent, it will let you. The next attack we're going to talk about is the Magic Bomb. Raksha will stun you temporarily and drop a Magic Bomb on your location. When this happens, you want to use Freedom and run away to avoid all damage. If you're hit, you'll be stunned and hit for 4000 plus damage, and your overhead prayers will be temporarily disabled. Once the Magic Bomb hits you, Purple Smoke will land in a 3x3 square on the location the bomb landed and it will hit for rapid 2,000 damage if stood on. Keep track of where the smoke is and avoid standing on it later on in the fight. If you do get hit by the magic bomb and your freedom is on cooldown, you can equip a shield from your invent and spam the resonance ability as well as surge. This will greatly increase your chance of survival. The amount of magic bombs you receive depends on the phase and shadow and rage percent, but it will usually be between 1 and 4. Keep moving around until you don't see this icon underneath your character. When you don't see the green icon, you know that Raksha is not about to drop a bomb on your head. The next special attack we're going to be talking about is the Magic Charge. It's highly unlikely that you're going to encounter this special attack, and if you do, there might be something worth tweaking in your DPS rotation. 
The special attack is not incredibly difficult, but it is annoying and it will greatly disrupt the flow of the fight. And because of that, if you're consistently getting magic charges, it may be worth looking into your rotations. The special will only occur if your damage per minute is under 130,000. A decent revolution bar in tier 90s should output over 200,000 damage per minute, if you're including a familiar and vulnerability and everything else you have passively dealing damage. Although it isn't terribly difficult to skip this attack, and it's well worth it, I'm going to talk about what happens if you do end up getting a magic charge. Raxual will move into the center of the room and blast the player with 5 charges. And Raxual will increase in shadow energy percentage for each shadow pool on the ground. You want to pray deflect magic, and optionally use devotion as well. Each charge will hit you roughly 1500 damage through prayer, and if you want to attack shadow pools on the ground to extend devotion to 20 seconds, you can do that as well. After you've taken the 5 hits, the fight will resume. The fourth attack we're going to look at is the Mind Lock. Raksha will immobilize you and spawn two to five shadowy orbs around you. Click on each orb once to free yourself, and once clicked, you'll be freed and the fight will resume. While shadow orbs are present, you'll be hit for rapid 600 damage. If ignored after seven seconds, you'll be hit 3000 damage per orb, but this should never happen and you'll have plenty of time to click on each of them. It's worth noting you may need to rotate your camera to see all the orbs, and at times they can spawn underneath Raksha, and the easiest way to rotate your camera is by holding down your middle mouse button and then moving your mouse. Once you've clicked on the orbs, you're good to go. This is a really easy one. You get immobilized, you click on all the shadow orbs, and then you resume the fight like nothing happened. The fifth and final special attack we're going to be talking about is the Shadow Manifestation. Raksha will summon a Shadow Manifestation dog that will walk towards you and attack you with melee. The Shadow Manifestation has a very weak melee attack that hits under 700 damage, but he also has a bite attack that will cause him to attack very rapidly, dealing sneaky high damage. The Manifestation does not pose a great threat, but he can kill you unexpectedly if you ignore him. The Manifestation should either be killed with basic abilities or kited around the room. When you're first learning this boss, I would recommend chucking a couple basic abilities on him so that it's not one more thing you have to look out for. Once you've cleared him, you're good to continue fighting the boss as you were before. Now it's time to go through every phase of the boss fight and talk about the order of mechanics as well as anything else that you may need to add. Before I get into this, it's worth noting that every single special attack will be separated by four auto attacks, which means, for example, for phase one, Raksha will auto attack you four times and then do a tail swipe. Then there will be four more auto attacks into a magic bomb. Four auto attacks after that, and you'll end up with a second tail swipe, and then four more auto attacks after that, you'll receive a second magic bomb. The fifth attack in phase one is the magic charge. After the fifth special attack, Raksha will restart his rotation and he will continually go through those same five attacks until he reaches 600,000 life points. During this phase, shadow pools are going to spawn on the ground and they can be completely ignored so long as you're able to get the boss to 600,000 life points before that magic charge. If you're unable to do so and you receive a second magic bomb without being close to phasing it, you want to begin clearing the shadow pools off the floor before the magic charge to avoid a significant jump in shadow energy percent. In a couple minutes, we're going to go through a number of different methods for clearing the shadow pools off the floor, but just know that if you do get that second magic bomb, you may have to go clear the pools before the end of the first phase. As soon as Raksha reaches 600,000 life points, the phase will end and all remaining special attacks will be skipped. Rocks will begin to fall from the sky that can be dodged or reduced with either debilitate or a power burst of vitality. How the rockfall works is you're going to see a shadow followed by a large boulders. So as long as you're clicking in areas where you don't see any shadows, you're going to be completely safe from the boulders. Without reducing it at all, a boulder will hit about 4,000 damage, so it's not the end of the world, and you can eat up or power burst or use debilitate, and any of those options are completely good. While these rocks are falling, you want to continue attacking the boss. Phase 2 will open up with a mind lock and follow that up with a tail swipe and then a magic bomb. After that, you're going to receive a second tail swipe and then the fifth attack is a magic charge. It's exactly the same as with phase 1, where ideally you're not getting that magic charge and you're able to get the boss to 400,000 life points before that point. That being said, if you get special attack number 4, which is a second tail swipe, you are going to want to clear those shadow pools once again to make sure that the magic charge doesn't increase your shadow and rage percentage by too much. As soon as Raksha reaches 400,000 life points, the phase is going to end and once again you're going to have a rock fall and it's going to be exactly the same as the one at the end of the first phase. Phase 3 is where things get interesting. Every time Raksha uses a special attack in phase 3, he will heal 2500 life points and increase his shadow energy by 1% for each shadow pool on the ground. Because of this, you want to start phase 3 by clearing all of the shadow pools and you want to periodically clear them as they respawn throughout the phase. 
For the next little bit, we're going to talk about the basic and advanced methods of clearing the shadow pools. With ranged, the easiest simple method is to equip mechanized chinchampas and clear them quickly and effectively by using any ranged abilities that will then act as an AoE. Optionally, if you don't want to use chins, you could use corruption shot, ricochet, or bombardment to clear them. Here's what it looks like with ranged. I have phase ratchet to 400,000 life points and rocks begin to fall. While this is happening, I'm simply going around the room and attacking the shadow pools. It's as easy as that. You'll see I miss a couple pools, and in the time period that I'm clearing them, a couple pools respawn as well. But even though I'm going very slowly here, I'm still able to clear all the pools with only 5% shadow energy, which is extremely playable. A couple mechanics in a phase 3, you're going to see the pools are going to start to respawn again. I'm going to quickly get rid of the shadow manifestation on me, and then I'm going to clear those pools as well. If you're close to reaching 200,000 life points, which is the end of the phase, it's not completely necessary to get rid of all the pools, but that shadow energy can really ramp up, and I would recommend, especially for your first kills, taking care of those pools on phase 3 as often as you need to. If you're using magic, you can use barrage spells from the ancient spellbook to auto-attack the pools. And you can also use Corruption Blast, Chain, or Dragon Breath to clear stacks of pools together without being on Ancients quickly and effectively. That's the basic method for both combat styles, but if you want to get a little bit more spicy and add a little bit of complexity, there's a much better method of clearing the pools quickly and effectively every single time. Let's get into the advanced method. This method is a little bit more click intensive, but once mastered, it is extremely effective, and it looks a little something like this. When using Bladed Dive with Laceration Boots on, Bladed Dive will act as an area of effect attack, hitting all nearby targets. Whenever a target is killed, Bladed Dive will also have its cooldown reset. Because of this, you'll be able to Bladed Dive over and over and over again, going from pool to pool to pool. This allows you to use a long-range weapon like a Noxious Scythe, Masuda's War Spear, or Dragon Rider Lance to clear stacks of pools instantly. It's the most advanced method, but also the fastest, and the safest by far, and it is absolutely worth learning if you are planning on camping this boss for an extended period of time. It looks like this. The boss has reached 400,000 life points, so I'm going to equip my Masuda's War Spear and my Laceration Boots. I'm then going to blade a dive from pool to pool, clearing all of them. I'm also going to activate Soul Split here, as I'll get a very nice heal at the same time. I'm also going to note that an all-type cape, swapping to a melee stat boosting prayer, and perks such as Precise, Equilibrium, and Ruthless can guarantee that you'll instantly clear the pools every time. If you bladed dive a pool but deal less than a thousand damage and are unable to kill it, your bladed dive cooldown will not be reset and you'll have to revisit some slightly more conventional methods. That first clip made it look really easy, but there is one thing that you need to worry about, which is timing. If you try and clear the pools too early, what's going to happen is some pools are going to respawn while you're in the process of clearing them, which is what happens in this clip. Because I started clearing the pools the second the boss hit 400,000 life points, Raksha is actually going to respawn some pools and I actually have to go back and clear them again. It's not the end of the world and I was still able to keep my shadow energy percent all the way at zero, but you will lose some time doing this. If you want that perfect clean clearing where you only have to blade a dive four times to clear all the pools, what you want to do is you want to go ever so slightly later. I'd recommend phasing Rapture to 400,000 life points and then waiting between 7 and 9 seconds before bladed diving onto the first stack of pools. If you do this and you go ever so slightly later, you'll be able to clear them perfectly without any pools respawning. At the same time, going too early is a lot better than going too late. If you go too late, those stacks of pools on the ground are each going to ramp up the shadow energy percent significantly and you may end up having to teleport out. But I did want to mention that if you go and the pools respawn, that is completely normal, and for the next kill, just go ever so slightly later until you've got the timing completely fine-tuned. Let's watch those clips at the same time to get the difference in timing. I'll start the clips at the exact point that Raksha phases to 400,000 life points. Once you've cleared the shadow pools, phase 3 is quite simple. A shadow manifestation will spawn as the phase begins, and the mechanics are going to continue at the same time as this. You're going to get a mind lock, followed by a magic bomb, followed by a tail swipe that will come out with another shadow manifestation. This cycle will repeat until the phase ends. Phase 3 will end as soon as Raksha reaches 200,000 life points, and a cutscene will trigger, bringing the player to a new area for the final phase of the fight. Now that we're through the first three phases, let's take a look at phase 4. Raksha will be unable to move and loses all of his special attacks outside of the Tail Swipe and Magic Bomb. 
He will use a special attack every two times he auto attacks you. If you're standing in close range, he will always tail swipe you. And if you're standing far away, he will always use a magic bomb. The primary strategy for phase four is to stand in melee distance and step back to avoid the tail swipe each time. It looks like this. As you can see, I'm going to take my two auto attacks. I'm going to step back to block the tail swipe, and then I'm going to move back in. This is the primary mechanic of the fight, and once mastered, you will have an absolute cakewalk with phase four, and it should be easier than every other phase of the boss fight. After the first two tail swipes of phase four, the Erebus charge will begin. Raksha will scream. I will drag you into Erebus, and you will spawn a shield around him that can be attacked. The HP of the shield will vary depending on your shadow energy percent from the previous phase. At 0%, it will have 10,000 life points. You will have five or six abilities to destroy the shield before a shockwave will hit killing you instantly if you're in the open. If the shield has more life points than you're comfortable DPSing, you want to retreat and hide behind one of the four pillars in the room to avoid being insta-killed. After the shield breaks, Shadow Anima will appear on the ground all around the room. Each anima collected will add one stack of inner power, providing 10% increased damage to you. Once collected, inner power can be used by clicking on the special action button that is displayed on screen. Now that the Shadow Anima is on the ground and the shield has been broken, it's inner power time. It is advised at this point to leave melee distance and collect at least 8 plus shadow anima. There are two general ways to do this, and I'm going to go through the pros and cons of both right now. The first way to do this is to just run a half circle. In running a half circle, you'll be able to collect roughly half of the shadow anima, which should be enough to allow most of your abilities to hit the hit cap of 10,000 damage anyway. In running a semicircle, you're not going to have to deal with a magic bomb because you should be able to make it the entire way across back into melee distance before the next attack. This means that you're going to run across the room and then end up with another tail swipe from the opposite side of the room. The other way to do this is to run the full circle and collect all of the shadow anima. This is a strategy I'd only recommend if your damage output is a little bit on the lower side and you may need that extra. If you do need that extra damage or it's going to be more fun for you, what you do is you'd run a full circle. You'd continually run, but after two attacks, you'd still be outside of melee distance, so you'd get a magic bomb. When this happens, you're going to be stunned, you're going to use freedom, and then you're going to continue on your way until you get back to the beginning point. At this point, you're going to activate inner power, and it's damage time. Once you've gathered your shadow anima and you're back where you want to be in melee distance, you're going to press the special action button and finish off Raksha while continuing to avoid the tail swipe. A couple tips for inner power. If you stack 2-3 to three storm shards over phases 1-3, to three, using shatter inside an ultimate ability plus inner power will likely deal close to 30,000 damage. One other thing I'm going to mention is that abilities that hit rapidly will be most effective as you'll circumvent the hit caps. Some examples are Greater Ricochet, Rapid Fire, Asphyxiate, Shadow Tendrils, and the Saren Godbo special attack. We've now been through every single mechanic that the boss fight has to offer, so it's time to put everything together and take a look at one full kill. Throughout this kill, I'll also be commenting on little rotational things or positional things that I've found helped me in the fight but weren't worth putting in the initial slides. Let's get into it. As soon as you've been through a full kill, that will be the end of the guide. As soon as you walk up to Raksha, the boss fight is going to start and Raksha is going to wake up. As soon as he starts moving, I use one defensive ability and then I use Death Swiftness to get the timing right for when he's targetable. As soon as he's targetable, I'm going to throw a vulnerability bomb on the floor and I'm also going to use Fragmentation Shot, which is a bleed. As he walks towards me, I'm going to get double damage without having to do anything, which seems pretty good to me. Outside of that, there's not a whole lot else for the first phase. I've now taken four auto attacks, so I'm going to step back for that first tail swipe. After that, it's back on the boss, and I keep doing as much damage as I possibly can. One other thing that I didn't mention in the bulk of this guide is you can teleport out of this boss fight. So if you make a mistake or you get hit by a mechanic, you can just spam your teleport and it will allow you to exit the arena, which makes this a very safe boss fight with regard to dying. For the magic bomb, instead of letting it stun me, I actually used freedom early and then I used rapid fire afterwards so that I get a full rapid fire out without it getting cancelled, but that's completely personal preference. And as we're heading to the end of phase one here, we managed to get it done with only two mechanics. Now it's time for the rock fall, and what I'm doing here is I'm just looking for areas where I haven't seen the small rocks fall. So long as I'm just looking at that and not looking at anything else, you should be pretty safe and you shouldn't get hit by too many boulders. That being said, I used debilitate just in case so that if I did get hit by some rocks, they're not going to kill me. You're also going to see that I'm grabbing the occasional resonance. This is a really useful thing to do every 30 seconds because when you're praying correctly, you're only going to take a thousand damage at most. But when you miss a prayer flick, you're going to take up to 3k. That's a really big heal that you can get very frequently. Soul split flicking is where you turn on soul split between every prayer flick and you'll notice that I'm not doing this at all. That is intentional in this guide as it's not required to kill the boss without going through a lot of food. 
That being said, if you were to soul split flick, you wouldn't have to use any defensives or use any food throughout this entire boss fight. The special attack on phase 2 after the mind lock is another tail swipe, and I'm going to step back and get out of the way. Especially on the diagonals in phase 2, I found that sometimes this tail swipe will literally hit you from Narnia, so I tend to go a little bit early just in case. Just after the tail swipe, it's time to phase to 400,000 life points, which means it's time to clear the shadow pools. I'm not going to be doing the bladed dive method because once mastered, it's extremely easy, but especially for your first skill, some people will not have access to that, so I thought I'd do it the slow and steady way. As you can see, I'm going around as quickly as I possibly can to clear off these shadow pools, even though that means some will respawn. I'm going to go back to the beginning here to make sure that I'm tapping them all down. And now that the shadow pools are cleared, you're going to find that I am still at 0% shadow energy, which means that I've done them perfectly. After that, I'm going to use death swiftness and I'm going to immediately get on the shadow manifestation because he can really do a ton of damage, especially when I'm not wearing any armor. I'm going to throw another vulnerability bomb onto Raksha as I noticed that he wasn't vulned, and now I'm doing as much damage as I possibly can. Because I've been in the fight for over two minutes, I can actually use my adrenaline potion again, which is just going to give me a little bit of extra damage in my death swiftness rotation. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to stand at the edge of my death swiftness. I'm doing that so that if I did get a magic bomb there, I'm not losing the entirety of my alt. As you can see, I'm going to run a little lap here, and all of a sudden I am back in my death swiftness and able to attack with the shadow smokes on the ground far away. While the magic bomb is happening, Raksha will continue to attack me, and that counts for the four attacks required for Raksha's next spec. And because of that, only two attacks after I stop running around, I've got another tail swipe. After that, some pools respawn, and I am going to get another shadow manifestation. I elect to kill the shadow manifestation, but I'm ignoring the pools here, because I realize I'm only 30,000 damage away from phasing the boss. Because I chose to do this, I am going to end up with a couple percent of shadow energy, but it should still be a faster kill time for me than clearing the pools. If you had a number of pools or you were further away from finishing the phase, it would always be worth clearing those pools to ensure yourself a safer boss fight the rest of the way. Heading into phase four, the first thing you want to do is position yourself in the safe area for dodging the tail swipe. It's exactly where I'm standing there. You may optionally have to call your familiar as well as sometimes they can get stuck. After that, I've been attacked two times, so I'm going to step back two squares and then immediately step right back in, effectively dodging the tail swipe and going in for two more attacks. I'm also going to throw a vulnerability bomb on the ground, and that is the way to throw it if you want it to actually hit Raksha. It can be a little tedious at times, but any of those front squares that he's touching should work correctly. After that, it's another two attacks, and this time I don't have to step back because it's time for the Erebus charge and the shield. I'm going to clear the shield, and I elect to run a half lap, especially because just by looking at it, I see that the majority of the anima is on one side of the room. As you can see, I do my quick half lap around the room within the two auto attacks, which means that as soon as I'm in position on the other side of the room, I've got a tail swipe to dodge. Once I've dodged that first tail swipe, it's time to pop inner power, and I'm also going to use death swiftness as well as my adrenaline potion. Whether you need to alt here largely depends on your DPS rotations and your gear. Because I'm using tier 80s with no armor, I've found that death swiftness is a lot better than not using it in this instance, but if you're in full max gear, you likely don't need to bother with the ultimate ability. That being said, try both and compare your kill times to figure out which method is best for you. Now that I'm in my death stiffness, I'm going to prioritize abilities that hit a number of times. For me in this instance, the main one I'm going to be using is Rapid Fire. Outside of that, I'm going to be going through a simple DPS rotation, and you will see I miss a couple prayer flicks here and I do take some damage, but I'm still very comfortable at my HP, and you're going to see that we cruise our way towards the end of a successful kill. I don't think there are any other real tips for phase 4. It's a pretty straightforward phase so long as you can master the stepping two squares back to block the tail swipe. If you do get stunned, you may have to use freedom and relocate to a different area to avoid the smoke left from the magic bomb, but outside of that, it's very straightforward. As soon as you get Raksha's HP to 0, congratulations, you have successfully taken out Barney. My kill time with this setup was 5 minutes and 36 seconds, but it is completely normal to be well over that, especially for your first kill. Your kill times are going to gradually get better as you get more familiar with the mechanics, so I wouldn't worry about that a whole lot, especially when you're first learning. Okay, I think we've done it. Thank you all so much for watching this video. I hope you found it helpful, and as always, if you have any questions or comments or concerns or anything at all, the comment section down below is the place for that. My apologies for how long this guide took me to get out. I didn't want to rush a quick day of release or week of release guide, and I really wanted to take my time and make sure that I can make the best video I possibly could. It's going to be on the internet forever, so I'd rather it be my best work than something I slapped together quickly because I was feeling a lot of pressure to get the video out as quickly as I possibly could. Outside of that, I hope you're all well, best of luck with Raksha, and I will see you all a little later on for another video.